Realm presents Dead Air, Episode 10. One. The mood in the barn shifts dramatically. At the sight of Lynn Brockman, the tension in my mother's face morphs from defensiveness and guilt to fear and trepidation. Brockman crosses his arms. Well, Vicky, where's the gun? A muscle ticks in my mother's jaw as she squares off against him. Now isn't the time or the place to discuss this, she says stiffly. He smiles, slowly. Yellow teeth flash beneath two fleshy lips. Oh, I think it's exactly the time. There's a moment of silence, and then my mom half turns. Macy, honey, you should go. Her voice brooks no argument. She wants me out of this barn and away from Lynn Brockman, which would be the smart thing to do. But I can't leave her to face him alone. This isn't just about her anymore. This involves me now, too. The recorder in my pocket is still running, and I consider trying to get Brockman to confess or at least seriously implicate himself. But it's too much of a risk. I'm not stupid. Brockman is a dirty ex-cop whose job it is to clean up the Carlisle's messes. And right now... My mother and I are part of a pretty huge mess. I don't know how far he's willing to go to clean all this up, but I'm also pretty sure I don't want to find out. Fine. I spit the word like a spoiled teenager and spin in my best huff. As I turn, though, I slide my phone from my back pocket and shield it from view against my hip. No bars, but there's Wi-Fi, and I'm automatically connected thanks to my first visit. I can still get help. My thumb's hovering over the messenger app when Brockman calls, Hold on. No time to type something out. Even if I could, what if the recipient didn't check their phone for a few hours? Instead, I flick open the Facebook app. In two clicks, a blue button appears on the screen. Start live video. Turn around, Brockman barks, and drop the phone. I click the blue button and lower the phone to my hip as I face him. There's no reception anyway, I tell him. Even if I wanted to call 911, I couldn't. Please, whoever is tuning into my broadcast, get the hint and call the cops. Drop it, he says, indicating the phone. And risk cracking the screen? I crouch, setting it carefully on the ground, screen down. It means no video, but it also means he won't see the broadcast running. I half-heartedly push it toward him as though kicking it out of reach, but really I just want to make sure the mic picks up everything he says. Someone out there will be listening, and hopefully that someone will send help. Let Macy leave, my mother says tightly. This doesn't concern her. Brockman frowns. It has everything to do with her. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for her ridiculous podcast. My cheeks burn with indignation. The old Macy would have swallowed the emotion and kept quiet, but that's not who I am anymore. My ridiculous podcast uncovered the truth. An exasperated sigh slips through my mother's clenched teeth. Brockman smirks and takes a step toward me. Then maybe you can tell me where the gun is. Rather than answer, I cross my arms. Why do you care? Macy, my mother cautions. Brockman ignores her. Call it a professional interest. I think of Facebook Live running, capturing everything, transmitting the truth to the world. Is it because you were involved in covering up Peg's murder? Macy, my mother hisses. You're not helping. What, Mom? Brockman's been doing the Carlisle's dirty work for decades. I glare at the man. Haven't you? I realize that perhaps I've pushed him too far. Any amusement in his expression hardens into annoyance. You're a pain in the ass, you know that? Do you even think before you talk? Stirring up this old shit. What do you think would happen? You'd get famous by destroying a good man's life? I thought I'd find justice for Peg, I tell him. He rolls his eyes. Grow up. You don't care about justice. You're just looking for your 15 minutes of fame and are capitalizing on someone else's tragedy to get it. That's not true, I protest. But my rapidly heating cheeks betray that his barb struck uncomfortably close. Because of me, the world knows that Brandon McDonald is innocent. You mean the Irish lad who's dead because of your podcast? I suck in a breath, familiar guilt washing through me. He's dead because of you, I shout, fisting my hands. You killed him. Macy, 
My mother grabs my arm, jerking me back. I pull away from her. It's true, Mom, and you know it. You sent an innocent man to jail. I snap at both of them. I press my lips together to stop myself from saying more, keenly aware of the recorder in my pocket and my phone transmitting this entire confrontation. I'm happy for Brockman to go down for what he's done, but I'm less sure about throwing my mother under the bus along with him. My mom drops her eyes, ashamed. Brockman doesn't seem to feel any such remorse. He sent himself. I open my mouth to argue, but my mother grabs my arm again, pulling me around to face her. Enough, Macy. Len is right. What's past is past. Let it go. It takes me a moment to even process what she's saying, that she's still willing to participate in the lie. I thought she was on my side. I thought she believed in truth and justice like I did. Even now that the truth is out, she's unwilling to face it. I shake my head. And what, Mom? Let Ryan think he killed his mother? Maybe that's best, she says quietly. For all of us. I can't believe what I'm hearing. How many lives are you willing to destroy to cover up your secret, Mom? We're talking about Ryan's life here. I'm sure his trust fund will help ease the pain, she says, an edge of bitterness to her voice. I blink at her. Part of me wonders if I'd feel the same if I hadn't spent so much time getting to know Ryan. After all, that's how I saw him at first, too. A spoiled rich kid with the world at his fingertips and enough money to ease any obstacles in life. But now, I know him. Now I care about him. A lot. The guilt over his mother's death has been crushing him. And there's no amount of money that can fix that. Only the truth can. Richard Carlyle and Lynn Brockman have done nothing but ruin people's lives, I tell her. They haven't ruined ours, she says softly. Delilah's name is on the tip of my tongue, but then I think about my phone on the ground a few feet away. If I bring up Delilah, I'll be airing the details of her death to the world. As desperate as I am for the truth, I can't do that to her mother. I can't do that to Delilah's memory. Yes, they have, I tell her, and it ends now. Feeling triumphant, I spin on my heel and start toward the door. Vicky, control your daughter, Brockman barks. I wait for her to do his bidding, bracing myself against the sound of her voice calling me back. After all, she's been following his orders since the night of Peg's death. But there's only silence. And then she utters one word. No. Her refusal is so unexpected that I stumble to a stop. I glance toward her. Get out of here, Macy! She shouts at me. She's so focused on me that she doesn't see the rage twist Brockman's face. He charges forward, grabbing her shoulder. He throws her toward the nearest stall with such force that the wooden boards rattle as her head slams against them. She stumbles and collapses to the ground, dazed. The sudden violence startles the horse inside, an enormous chestnut stallion with wild black eyes. He rears back angrily and kicks at the walls. This sets off the other horses, and they all begin revolting. The entire barn rings with the sound of screaming horses. Mom! I shout. I start toward her, but think better of it. Not with Brockman there. He's bigger and stronger than I am, and who knows if he has a weapon. I need to get out of here. I need to get help. I lunge toward the door, but the lock is an elaborate electronic pad. I punch the open button and a keypad appears, demanding a code. I curse under my breath and start hitting buttons randomly, hoping to set off some sort of alarm, but nothing happens. Then Brockman is there. His meaty hands wrap around the neck of my shirt, hauling me backward. Before I can apply any of the moves I learned in self-defense class, he delivers an elbow to my gut, a direct shot on my solar plexus. And suddenly, I can't breathe. I fall to my knees, fingers digging at the ground as my lungs refuse to draw air. I'm helpless to fight against him as he drags me toward an empty stall and throws me down near my mother. She's half-conscious, still stunned from the blow to the head. I struggle to reach for her, to call for her, but my body refuses to respond. A dark haze crowds my vision as my chest spasms from lack of oxygen. Brockman returns to my mother, kicking over the black vet bag that lies discarded by the stall door. Medical supplies scatter everywhere. He paws through them, glancing at various bottles until he finds what he wants. In a smooth motion, he grabs a syringe and pulls the cap off with his teeth. He jabs the needle into the bottle, fills it, and without hesitation, jams it into my mother's arm. Sweet dreams. 
he says, depressing the plunger. He makes it look so simple, as if he's done this before. And suddenly, all I can think about is Delilah lying in an empty hotel room, dead, a needle dangling from her arm. Brockman was there, had to be. He was the one to slip that needle into her arm. He was the one to kill her. Like he won't hesitate to kill us now. He drags my mother's limp body deeper into the empty stall, grabs another bottle, and spins toward me. I'm dizzy from lack of air and my chest is on fire, but I have to do something. I can't let him inject me, too. I force myself to my feet, leaning heavily against the empty stall door. Brockman eyes me impassively. It's obvious he doesn't see me as a challenge. He thinks he'll be able to swap me down, the same as my mother. And then, who knows what he plans on doing? Probably dump our bodies in some ravine where we'll never be found unless some college kid a decade from now decides to look into our disappearance for some quixotic little podcast. I glance around, searching for a weapon, or at the very least, a distraction. My eyes land on a bright red button a few stalls away. I remember Ryan pointing it out during my private tour. It's a quick release for the stalls in case of emergency. This qualifies as an emergency. I stagger toward it. Brockman realizes too late what my plan is. I crash against the button before he can stop me. There's a loud buzz, and then the clatter of more than a dozen thick wooden doors sliding open at once. At either end of the barn, the massive doors leading outside begin to roll back. The horses bolt. It's chaos, their huge gleaming bodies glistening with sweat, their massive teeth flashing as they scream, their legs pumping as they rear, horseshoes gleaming as they kick. I flatten myself against the wall, but Brockman isn't so fast. He's caught out in the open. A large chestnut pummels into him, knocking him sideways. He falls to the floor, arms over his head as he rolls away from the thundering hooves. The horses race up and down the center aisle, desperate for escape, but the outer doors are too slow to open, the gap between them narrow enough to keep the stallions trapped, but wide enough for me to slip through. Just as I bolt toward them, a loud bang echoes through the barn. A gunshot. The wall by my head splinters, a shard of wood slicing along my cheek. I drop to the floor and roll through the nearest open stall door, and find myself in Peg's old office. I push to my feet and lunge, grabbing the door. As I throw it closed, I see Lynn Brockman on the ground, the black barrel of a gun aimed in my direction. Two. I slide the office door closed hard enough that the walls shudder. I fumble for the lock, twisting it into place. For a split second, I feel safe. Then I realize there are no windows in Peg's office. No way out except the door I've just blocked. Which means I'm trapped. And my cell phone is still out in the main barn. Probably trampled to pieces and no longer broadcasting at this point. I need help. Not just for me, but for my mother. I have no idea what he injected her with. I dive for the desk, searching for a landline. There isn't one. I curse under my breath. Panic builds behind my eyes, making my vision blur. The world around me tilts, and my hands shake. I can't afford to lose it. Not right now. I take a shuddering breath and clench my fists so hard my nails slice into my palms. I have to calm down. I have to think. That's my only way out of this. The stallions continue to revolt in the main barn. Eventually, someone will hear and come running. I just need time. But then a deep rattling vibration shudders through the walls as the large outer doors roll completely open. Hooves thunder past the office, the horses escape into the pen outside. Suddenly, the barn feels eerily silent. I hear footsteps approaching. I called 911, I shout. Just because there's no phone doesn't mean Brockman knows that. The cops are on their way. He laughs. No, they're not. My heart stutters. Is he just trying to call my bluff? They are, I insist. I told them everything. For someone who prides herself on being a journalist, you really have no idea how this stuff works, do you? There are apps that monitor police frequencies. If you'd called 911, they'd have put out a call on the radio, and I'd have gotten an alert. No alert means no call. Nice try, though. His voice sounds closer, just on the other side of the door. I picture his gun, the gleaming empty hole at the end of the barrel, and stumble deeper into the office. It doesn't matter, I try to make my voice sound strong, defiant, 
You just let millions of dollars worth of horses escape. That will have half the farm running down here to corral them. Already taken care of, he tells me, sounding calm and confident. They've all been dismissed for the evening. You may not believe me, Mackenzie, but I'm actually good at what I do. Unlike you, I plan ahead. I consider the angles. I think things through. The knob on the door rattles. I don't bumble into situations without making sure I have a way out. He knows I'm trapped. He knows he has me beat, that it's only a matter of time. But he doesn't know about the Facebook live stream. He doesn't know his guilt has already been broadcast to the world. He doesn't know that I've already won. There's a loud crash and the wood around the door latch splinters. Rockman's done talking. He's trying to break into Peg's office, which means I'm almost out of time. My panic flips into overdrive. I need a weapon, some way to protect myself. But the office shelves are full of useless objects, old trophies, a saddle, riding crops, nothing I can use against Brockman. I find myself facing a large fireplace, staring at the heart-shaped rock set in the stone just above the mantel. Everything traces back to that rock. It was the inspiration for Peg's farm, the cornerstone of her office, a symbol of her belief in the purity of racing. I remember the photo I'd found of Peg at the start of my investigation. She'd been standing by this same fireplace, about to set the heart-shaped stone above the mantel. She'd been smiling, her features so bright and limitless. Little did she know that years later she'd be murdered in this same barn, trying to protect the horses she loved so much. I frown, remembering something out of that picture of Peg. There'd been something on the mantel, propped up in the opening where the heart-shaped rock was meant to go. I close my eyes, trying to picture it. A horseshoe. Not just any horseshoe. Lucky Girl's horseshoe. The one Peg was found clutching when she died. The one she'd been buried with. Except now, I knew she hadn't been holding it when she was murdered. It had been an afterthought, added later, for sentimental reasons, maybe. But maybe for another reason as well. I move toward the fireplace and step up on the ledge in front of the hearth. With trembling fingers, I reach for the heart-shaped stone. The cement surrounding it is cracked. I pry at it, splintering my nails as I try to find purchase. Finally, it moves. I pull harder, scraping the skin from my fingertips in the process. The rock pops free, revealing a small secret compartment tucked behind it. And in that small compartment sits a small silver gun. I recognize it immediately from photos of Peg as a girl, a derringer with a pearl handle. Her derringer. I pull it free just as the door crashes open behind me. Three. Brockman stands in the wreckage of the door, chest heaving from the effort of smashing it down. His gun hangs in his hand by his side. I heave my own gun up and point it at him. It feels so small, just like the toy Ryan's grandfather described it as. But we both know how deadly it is. After all... This is the gun that killed Peg Graham. Though I have no idea if it's loaded. No idea if after all these years it will even work. No idea if I'll be able to pull the trigger. And if I do, whether I'll be able to come close to hitting him. But that doesn't matter. Because now I have a gun pointed at him. And that seems to change everything. His eyes dart past me to the mantle above the fireplace. And the heart-shaped stone shoved to one side. All this time... He says, shaking his head. The gun's been right here. He then looks at me, a slow smile spreading across his face. Go ahead and put the gun down, Mackenzie. No, I tell him through clenched teeth, because finally I have the upper hand, and there are still questions I need answers to. Tell me what happened to Dalala. He frowns, appearing legitimately confused. Who? My cousin, Delilah, I shout at him. The woman you shot up with heroin in a hotel room and left to die. His gun hand twitches and he starts to lift his arm. Don't, I growl at him, tightening my grip around the pearl handle of my own gun. He clucks his tongue against his teeth. It's over, Mackenzie. We both know you won't pull the trigger. He might be right. He might be wrong. But I'll never know. Because right then, another figure slips into the barn. She might not, Officer Matthews says in a steady voice, her gun trained on Brockman. But I will. 
Everything happens fast after that. Brockman's eyes go wide with surprise. He starts to turn, gun hand rising. There's a flash of light and a sharp bang that ricochets through the empty stalls. It's followed by another and another as Officer Matthews unloads her clip. Brockman crumbles to the ground. Blood seeps into the hay scattered around him. He doesn't move. I'm frozen in shock. Then I stumble forward. Matthews jerks toward me, gun still raised. The gun, Macy, she reminds me. I stare at my hand. I'd forgotten I was still holding it. I drop it as if the metal is scorching my palm. Officer Matthews kicks Brockman's gun from his limp hand and crouches next to him, feeling for a pulse. My thoughts finally unscramble, my panicked paralysis disappearing. I start forward. Call an ambulance, I shout at her. She looks at me oddly. I'm afraid doctors aren't going to be much help to him. Not for him! I race to the stall holding my mother. She's lying propped against the wall, her hair matted with blood, eyes glazed, chest rising and falling lethargically. When she sees me, she blinks, her fingers twitching. I drop to her side, reaching for her hand. It's okay, Mom, I tell her. I'm here. Officer Matthews appears in the stall door. Instantly, she's on her radio, asking about the status of the ambulance. They're almost here, she tells me. I called them the minute I saw your Facebook Live broadcast. In the distance, I hear the faint whine of sirens approaching. I keep my lips pressed tightly together, my mom's hand clutched in my own as tears trail down my cheeks. I can't lose her, despite the role she's played in all of this. The ambulance arrives, washing the interior of the barn in flashes of blue and red. Officer Matthews directs the paramedics toward the stall, and I step back as they crouch by my mother, checking her vitals. I want to ask if she'll be okay, but I don't want to distract them. Instead, I hover in the background, trying not to think about what I'll do if something happens to her. They get her strapped on the stretcher and start for the parking lot. I chase along after them. Is she gonna be okay? She's stable, one of them says, but we need to get her to the hospital for observation. Can I go with her? The paramedic shakes his head. No room. You'll have to follow on your own. I barely have a chance to squeeze my mother's hand and press a kiss to her cheek before she's gone. The ambulance doors slam shut, the lights begin to twirl, and the siren lets out a low wail that climbs in pitch. I watch, helpless, as they drive away. And then, I'm alone. I stand there, my arms wrapped around my middle, totally numb. As if this is all happening to someone else. I glance around. Officer Matthews is hovering near Brockman's body, answering several cops' questions. One of them notices me looking their way and approaches. Is this yours? He holds out my cell phone. I'm surprised it wasn't smashed to pieces by the horses. I take it and make sure the Facebook Live broadcast is off before slipping it into my pocket. We're going to need a statement, Miss Walker, he continues. I, I have to get to the hospital, I tell him. Are you hurt? He asks, concerned. I shake my head. No, but my mother... We're interrupted by the sound of screeching tires as a car careens into the parking lot. It comes to an abrupt stop and the driver's door swings open. It's Ryan. Macy, he shouts, sprinting toward me. He doesn't even slow, just crashes into me, folding me in a fierce hug. When I saw the ambulance, he can't finish the statement. He swallows several times before he speaks again. But you're okay. Thank God you're okay. He's so strong, so solid and I wrap my arms around him, allowing him to bear my weight. It feels so, so nice to have someone to lean against at this moment. I close my eyes, inhaling deeply, letting his familiar scent ground me. I got the alert when you started broadcasting. His voice rumbles in his chest under my cheek. I called Officer Matthews, but she was already on her way. I drove as fast as I could. I was so scared I wouldn't get here in time, and then my phone reception dropped and I lost the connection to your broadcast, and... He shudders, his lips finding my temple. He pulls back, tucks a strand of hair behind my ear. What happened? I got the truth, I tell him simply. You didn't kill your mother. Neither of us mentions the real culprit, his father. Nor do I mention the fact that my mother helped cover it up. He pulls me against him again. I'm so sorry, he says, voice breaking. So, so sorry. For what? I ask, my voice muffled against his neck. This wasn't your fault. 
He steps back, hand thrust into his hair. Isn't it? I'm the one who got you into this. I'm the one who called the station and suggested there was more to my mom's murder. I blink, suddenly confused. That was you? He shrugs. I've had questions about my mom's death for so long, but I never did anything about it. I think I was scared of what I might find or what I might not find. When I heard your show, I started thinking that maybe you were someone who could understand that. I called in before I could stop myself, but then the next day I couldn't stop thinking about it. I realized I couldn't just hand the case over to you and step back. My mother's death is part of who I am. I had to be involved in figuring that out. I asked my next question very carefully. So were you just hanging out with me in order to keep tabs on my investigation? He hesitates and my heart twists. This has been one of my biggest fears when it comes to Ryan, that he's been using me this entire time. I brace myself for the truth, but it turns out the truth is more complicated than I expected. Maybe in the beginning, he says, but not once I got to know you, he quickly adds. He reaches out and cups my cheek. Certainly not now. I don't know how to feel about any of this. Too much has happened. My head is still spinning. My system still running on adrenaline. The siren of my mom's ambulance still echoes in my ears. My mom, I say, fumbling in my pockets for my keys. I find the recorder. It's still running. I press stop. I have to go be with her. Except my hands are shaking so badly that I end up dropping the keys. Ryan stoops to pick them up. I'll drive. He starts toward his car. I need to go on my own, I tell him. I need time to think. Oh. Okay. He struggles to hide his confusion at my sudden distance. He trails me to my car, holding the door open as I slip behind the wheel. Will you be okay? He asks. I can only offer him the truth. I don't know. When will I see you again? He asks. I give him the same answer. I don't know. I pull the door closed and start the car. There's so much left unsaid, but I don't have time to think about it. I have to get to the hospital. I have to get to my mom. As I pull out of the parking lot, I glance in the rearview mirror and see Ryan watching me drive away, standing there on the edge of the driveway as a dozen cop cars stream past him. Some stop at the barn, but most continue up to the house, on their way to arrest Dick, I presume. I imagine there will soon be another half dozen cops on their way to Richard's house for the role he played in the cover-up. When I started this investigation, it never occurred to me that it would lead to this, that I'd be putting my own family at risk. I begin to tremble as reality starts to take hold. I finally know the truth about Peg's death, but at what cost? Brockman is dead. Brandon McDonald is dead. Delilah is dead. Ryan's family is destroyed. His father is a murderer. His grandfather complicit in who knows what. My own family may be destroyed as well. Even if my mother survives, she still helped to cover up Peg's murder. Once that becomes public, she could lose her job, her vet tech license. She might even go to jail. Is knowing the real story behind Peg's death worth all of that? I'm not sure. I may never be. Four. I slip on my heels and look at myself in the mirror and hesitate. I'm not quite sure what the proper attire for the day might be. I'm pretty sure Emily Post never had an entry on what to wear to the hearing in which your maybe used to be your boyfriend's father confesses to killing his wife. I decide to go with something funeral adjacent and throw on my go-to Navy tank dress. Normally, I don't give quite as much consideration to my appearance, but this afternoon's hearing is a big deal in Lexington. The news has been hounding Ryan's family constantly since the showdown in Hearthstone Farm several months ago. Of course, that's thrust me and my family into the spotlight as well, because we're one of the main reasons Dick Carlisle and his father are going to jail. If it weren't for me, the truth would have remained buried. And if it weren't for my mom turning state's evidence and testifying against Dick and Richard, they might have weaseled out of the charges. As grateful as I am for the opportunities the wild success of dead air has brought me, it's come with a lot of headaches, too. My life isn't private anymore. Strangers online feel free to make wild speculations about my past. There are all sorts of conspiracy theories about my role in investigating Peg's death. And the threats? 
There are more people than I would have expected who can't stand to see a woman succeed and feel the need to do anything in their power to break her down. It's made me a lot more cautious. But it's also made me more resolved. I understand now that having a voice means power, and the desire to use that power for justice burns in my chest, the same way it did for Delilah. I check my watch. It's way too early to leave, so I sit at my computer and navigate to my favorite time waster, Reddit. The dead air board is as active as ever. Already there's a thread about today's hearing. Fuck you. How long is the big dick going away for? I'm taking bets. Serious wagers only. Serial fan. I'm betting life. Does Kentucky even have the death penalty? If so, he should totally get it. Pod Esquire. Sigh. He's not getting the death penalty, Serial. First of all, his case isn't death eligible. And second of all, he's pleading guilty to second-degree manslaughter, which in Kentucky carries a sentence of five to ten years. So he's definitely not going away for even close to life. Scholar, dude. At least his dad will be joining him in jail. How long do you think he's going away for? Pod Esquire. That's a tougher question. They couldn't pin Peg's death on him, just the cover-up. And while there's a lot of evidence he was involved in some other shady shit, it seems like a lot of it is circumstantial. I'm guessing he gets less time than Dick does. He could even get off with just probation. Serial fan. Seriously? Second-degree manslaughter for Dick? Probation for Richard? This system sucks. They should throw the book at those assholes. Pod Esquire. Welcome to the justice system. The DA gets to choose what they charge people with, and that often results in disparities, especially across racial and socioeconomic lines. The DA could have tried for first-degree manslaughter, but it would have been a tougher case, and he probably went with second degree in order to induce Dick to plead guilty. As for Richard... How often do you see anyone throwing the book at old, moneyed, powerful white men? Fuck you. Breaking news. Wealthy, influential white man gets much better treatment in the U.S. justice system. Oh, wait. That's not news. I'm pulled from my reading by my chirping phone. A photo of my father pops up on the screen. I take a deep breath and smile so I sound cheerful. Hey, Dad. What's up? Hey, kiddo. He says. Just checking in on you. We both know that's not the real reason he's calling. He's been watching the Carlisle's legal proceedings like a hawk. He knows about the hearing scheduled for later today, which means the press will be swarming more than usual. He's worried about me. I save him the trouble of having to figure out a way to subtly bring up the topic. Yes, Dad, I'm going to the hearing, and yes, I'm okay on my own. You're sure you don't want me to go with you? He's made the same offer for every hearing before this. I'm okay. I assure him, but I appreciate you calling to check in. Seriously, it means a lot. Well, we love you, Macy, and we support what you're doing. Both of us. He emphasizes the last bit. There's a momentary silence, the one that always hovers around the topic of my mother. You coming to dinner on Wednesday? He asks. I hesitate. I haven't been to a family dinner since the showdown at the barn several months ago. At first, it was because my mom was still in the hospital recovering. Then, once she was home, she was still too weak. Then the fallout from her role in the cover-up of Peg's death began to hit, and I felt it was best that I stayed away. Partly, it's my own guilt that keeps me away. Partly, it's my mother's anger. Not that she blames me for the truth coming to light. She's just had a difficult adjustment after losing her job and having her professional reputation ruined. Plus, there's my own anger. She lied to me, my dad, to all of us, for almost two decades. She let an innocent man go to jail for murder. She was willing to let Ryan believe he'd killed his mother. She let Brockman convince her to deter me from the investigation. She's not the woman I thought she was, and I haven't figured out how to have a relationship with the woman she is now. I'll think about it, I tell him. It's the same answer I've given him every other time he's asked. We both know it means no. We'll set a place for you, he says. Be careful at the hearing today. We love you. Thanks, Dad. Love you, too. Just as I finish saying goodbye, there's a knock at the door. I end the call, frowning. Not long after the Heartstone Farm incident, I was forced to move to a new apartment that provided more privacy and security. 
Thankfully, the immense popularity of dead air and the ad revenue it generates provides enough extra cash that I can afford it. I've decided not to feel guilty about spending the money on my own security, especially since the show is the reason I need that level of security in the first place. The new complex has a gate with a 24-hour guard, which means no one should be able to just show up at my door unannounced. Cautiously, I move toward the window and glance down to the parking lot. A large, gleaming silver Bentley is idling below, a uniformed driver sitting patiently behind the wheel. Hardly the car one would expect a stalker to drive. I check the peephole and my confusion deepens. It's Grandma Georgia. I have no idea what she's doing here. Nervously, I press my hand against my dress to straighten it and then open the door. Mrs. Graham, I say, forcing a smile. How lovely to see you. It's Georgia and you know it. She doesn't wait for an invitation, just sweeps inside as though she owns the place. She turns to face me. I figured we could both use a drink before this afternoon's fiasco, and I'm betting a good Kentucky girl like you keeps a bottle of bourbon around for just such emergencies. It's the absolute last thing I expect her to say. I'm suddenly grateful Kara gave me a bottle as a moving out gift. Unfortunately, though, I don't have any crushed ice. She barks a laugh. Then we'll just have to drink it neat. She claps her hands. Now, where do you keep your glasses? I lead her into the kitchen and start preparing the drinks. She takes a sip, nods her approval, and leans back against the counter. With pearls draped around her neck and diamonds dangling from her ears, she certainly stands out in my very minimally decorated apartment. And yet, somehow, she looks at home, like she could fit in anywhere. If anything, I suddenly feel like the one who doesn't belong. Except for the phone call about Curtis Cox, I haven't spoke with Georgia since we first met at Hearthstone Farm months ago. I have no idea why she's suddenly here now. I tap my fingers against my glass nervously, waiting for her to say something. She glances around the apartment, appraising her surroundings before her eyes fall on me. She takes another sip and tips her head to one side, appraising me for long enough that I shift uncomfortably. How are you, Mackenzie? She says it so earnestly that my eyes blur with tears. Startled by my own response, I take a swallow of bourbon, hoping the burn in my throat will sear away the emotions rising in my chest. I realize that no one else in my life has asked me this question recently. It's not like they don't care about me. I don't doubt that. It's just that the fallout from dead air has hit them hard, and everyone's doing what they can to survive. Ryan is still trying to come to terms with the fact that his father killed his mother and his grandfather covered it up. And my mother is trying to come to terms with the end of her career. Everyone else's lives have been completely upended, while mine has just been set on edge. I want to tell Georgia that I'm okay, but when I open my mouth, the words won't come. I don't know, I tell her instead, but that's not exactly true either. She says nothing, giving me space, and I end up sharing the emotion that's been living coiled up inside my chest for months. Do you think Ryan will hate me one day for being the one to bring all this to light? She lifts an eyebrow. Do you? I don't know. He says no, but how can he not? Is that why you've been holding back? A blink surprised at her question. Did Ryan say something? No, but I'm not blind. I've been living at the house with him since his father was arrested. I see that he's got more on his mind than all of that. She taps a finger against her glass. He misses you, Mackenzie. I look down. I want to believe her, but everything's been so complicated the last few months. Ryan and I talked several times after the incident at the barn, but it started to feel strange, off in some way I couldn't put my finger on. After a while, it just became easier to avoid each other. I assumed the feeling was mutual. Did you ever consider that he could be scared of the same thing as you are? She asks. That he's going to hate me? She purses her lips, disappointed that I've missed her point. Or that you'll hate him for bringing you into this? I frown. But it was my decision to investigate Peg's death. She smiles, satisfied. Well, there you go. Turns out you're both adults with your own agency.
Maybe you should both stop guessing at what the other person's thinking and feeling and actually talk to each other about it. I stare down into my glass. It's empty. I tend to drink a whole lot faster when I'm uncomfortable or nervous, but the warm buzziness in my head gives me the courage to say, I just keep waiting for everyone to blame me for all of this. I shrug, which I guess they have a right to. She looks at me a long moment and then sets her glass on the counter. There's a fierceness to her expression that makes me concerned I've said something wrong. I brace myself for her response. You know, Mackenzie, she says, pointing at me. Let me tell you something I've learned in life. We women tend to take the blame for things when it doesn't belong to us. We blame ourselves if it rains during a picnic, like we control the weather. Women blame themselves for the actions of bad men every day. She narrows her eyes at me. Did you murder my daughter? I'm startled by the question. Of course not. Did you convince an innocent man to take the fall? No. Did you spend years lying to cover up the crime? I shake my head. She throws up her hands. Then why are you taking the blame for what those men did? You can't hold yourself responsible for the fallout of other people's poor decisions. Tell that to the internet, I grumble. That's like half of Reddit's entire existence. That doesn't mean you have to listen to them, she says, or believe them. She picks up the bourbon and splashes another swallow into her glass before holding the bottle out to me. I glance at the clock on the stove. More time has passed than I realize. I should go. She waves a hand. We've got time. I shake my head. The gallery's gonna be crowded with all the press. I may already be too late to find a seat. That's why you'll be sitting with the family. Trust me, they're not starting without us. I've waited years for this, and I've made damn sure I'll be front and center when Richard Carlyle finally gets his ass handed to him. My heart pounds at the thought of sitting with the family. With Ryan, I assumed that if he wanted me with him, he'd have asked. So far, he hasn't. I'm not sure that's a good idea, I tell Georgia. She pours another shot of bourbon in my glass. I don't care. Five. The courthouse is mobbed with so many reporters and onlookers that if I'd been driving myself, I'd have had to park a mile away. But George's chauffeur maneuvers us right up to the curb as though we're celebrities appearing on the red carpet before an award show. The press certainly treats us that way. They swarm the car, shouting questions at Georgia the minute she emerges. It takes them longer to realize who I am, but as soon as they do, the din only grows louder. I slip my hand into my purse where I already have my voice recorder running. After all, I have my own podcast episode to prepare. If anyone wants to hear from me personally, they'll know where to tune in. Georgia plows through the crowd with her chin held high as if she owns the place, and sure enough, the throng parts to let her pass. I scamper along in her wake until we reach the courthouse itself. Once we're past the metal detectors, the din calms. That's when my nerves kick into gear. More than once, I consider slipping away, getting lost in the crowd, but I watch the way Georgia carries herself, like a warrior going into battle, and I try to emulate her the best I can. Then, I see Ryan, and I falter. He's waiting outside the courtroom, oblivious to the reporters orbiting around him. Cameras train on him, waiting for some sort of twitch in his facial expression. A comment, anything to betray how he's feeling. But he keeps his expression rigidly neutral, his lips pressed tight, until he sees me. Then there's a quiver in the muscle along his jaw, and for a moment, I wonder if it's anger, if I've made a huge mistake. At George's arrival, most of the press abandons Ryan and turns their focus on the matriarch, which gives Ryan and me a small pocket of quasi-privacy to say hello. I'm suddenly nervous, afraid of saying the wrong thing, not sure what he needs to hear. So I ask myself what Mackenzie would do in this situation. I pull my recorder out of my pocket and hold it up to him. Anything you'd like to comment on, Ryan Graham Carlyle? He lifts an eyebrow. Are you asking as Mackenzie Walker the reporter or as my girlfriend, Macy? My breath catches. It feels too easy, but maybe that's the way it should be if both people want the same thing. And I've known for a while now that I want Ryan. Can't I be both? He slips his hand into mine and squeezes tight. 
I wouldn't want it any other way. He lifts my fingers to his mouth and brushes his lips across my knuckles. And suddenly, all the distance between us, all the things left unsaid, all the confusion falls away. Six. The hearing itself isn't easy. Ryan stiffens when his father enters the room. Very little has changed about Dick Carlyle in the months since his arrest. At first glance, he appears put together, wearing an expensive suit with a subdued silk tie. But the puffiness around his eyes and the broken blood vessels modeling the tip of his nose indicate he's continued his previous lifestyle of debauchery. Not long after Dick takes his seat, the deputy calls the court to session and the hearing begins. There's a lot of back and forth. The prosecutor makes a statement, the judge asks questions, and Dick's attorney answers. Then it comes time for Dick himself to speak. He stands and glances back toward Ryan. Ryan's hands clench into fists, but otherwise he doesn't visibly react. He keeps his gaze straight ahead, refusing to meet his father's eyes. He sits that way during the entire allocution, rigidly unreactive, as though he's a statue. If it weren't for the storm in his eyes, one would think he wasn't even listening. But it's clear that he is, because I can feel the way his muscles jump, the way his breathing hitches, the way his hand searches out mine as his father tries to explain what actually happened the night of Peg Graham's death. It was an accident, Dick Carlisle explains. Peg loved those horses, and she was passionate about keeping racing clean, but she didn't understand the reality of racing. You can't race a clean horse and win, not when everyone else is doping. Trying to do so was going to bankrupt Hearthstone. We needed a champion, and Champion's Heart was our best shot. We needed him to win the Derby because we needed his legacy to fund our family's future. The night of her... He struggles, unable to say the word murder. He clears his throat and tries again. The night of her death, I was not at a dinner party. Instead, I was at the barns with Vicki Walker, a vet tech who often treated our horses. Even though I'm expecting it, I startle at my mother's name. I feel like every eye in the courtroom suddenly swivels my way. My first instinct is to shrink under the scrutiny, and I have to remind myself that my mother's crimes are not my own. Plus, in the end, she did the right thing by turning against Dick and Richard Carlyle. Together, we doped Champion's heart to get him ready for the derby. Dick lets out a trembling sigh. When Peg found us, she was furious. The argument got heated. He presses his fingertips against the table as though needing something to hold on to for balance. I don't know where the gun came from. It was Peg's. She wouldn't have used it. I didn't feel threatened. I tried to take it from her, but... It takes him a long time to finish the statement. But somehow... It... It went off, and my peg was hit. His voice grows softer, more ragged, more breath than words. It w was an accident, he says again. There's a murmuring in the gallery, the audience reacting to the story. I've spent so long thinking of Peg's death as a murder that it has been strange to recast it in my head as an accident. Though in some ways the distinction feels irrelevant. Regardless of how or why, the result is the same. Peg is still dead. Dick isn't finished. Uh, I panicked. I I'd been drinking earlier in the night. If the police ordered a blood test, they would have found cocaine in my system. So I called my father. He was the one to suggest we move the body, that we stage it as a murder. He's the one who got in touch with Len Brockman and paid him a fortune to cover things up. He stares down at his hands for a long moment. I loved my wife, and I, I'm deeply sorry for the role I played in her death. He turns back, looking at Ryan. I'm sorry for taking my son's mother away from him. Ryan inhales sharply, blinking rapidly. Then Dick sits, and Ryan lets out a breath he'd been holding. The rest of the hearing passes uneventfully. Finally, it's over, and we watch as they escort Dick out of the courtrooms. You okay? I ask Ryan. It takes him a moment to answer, and he frowns. Yeah, he eventually says. I think I am. He catches my eye, and the corner of his lips twitch into a smile. I mean, I'm obviously going to be in therapy for quite a while. 
But otherwise, I think I'm going to be fine. I slid my arm through his. If you find a good therapist, let me know. I could use one as well. He laughs. We make quite a pair, don't we? I meet his eyes. Yes, I tell him. We do. Together, we retrace our steps back outside, Ryan's hand tight around mine as we navigate the crush of reporters. When we reach the courthouse lawn, Georgia pauses, allowing the reporters to swarm around her, microphones thrust forward. I do have a statement I'd like to make, she says. A hush falls over the crowd. She looks my way and holds out a hand. My eyes go wide. I glance toward Ryan. He shrugs, appearing equally surprised. I resist the urge to smooth my dress or tuck my hair behind my ear. I take her hand, allowing her to pull me to her side. Georgia turns back to the reporters. I would like to thank Mackenzie Walker for uncovering the truth about the death of my daughter. Because of Macy, I'm here today to watch the state of Kentucky bring justice for Peg. She pauses, and I'm surprised to see a glistening of tears in her eyes. She squeezes my hand. There's a smattering of flashes as cameras go off around us. If you ask me, the world needs more Mackenzie Walkers. To that end, I've created the Peg Graham and Delilah Jones Memorial Scholarship for those students at UK whose aim is to pursue investigative journalism at the highest levels. To aid in that pursuit, I've also endowed the journalism department with funding for an additional professorship in the area of journalistic ethics and integrity, as well as a new journalism lab complete with a recording studio for any future students who would like to follow in Mackenzie's footsteps and produce their own podcasts. My knees suddenly feel weak. Georgia smiles at me. My hope is to create a generation of journalists who go after the truth with the support to follow where it leads. The press explodes with questions. Mackenzie, one of the reporters shouts, what's your reaction to this announcement? I open my mouth, but it's a struggle to find the words. I'm speechless. I swallow the tears lodged in my throat. But I'm also incredibly grateful that the new scholarship will honor my cousin Delilah, She's the one who taught me the importance of justice. I turn to Georgia. Thank you. Another reporter doesn't wait to ask, So there are no hard feelings for the way Mackenzie used your family for her podcast? Georgia stiffens, her eyes narrowing at the reporter. But Ryan is the one to step forward and answer. I'm the one who asked Macy to look into my mother's death. She has had the support of my family at every step, and that will continue. The reporters keep shouting questions, most of them focused on Ryan and Georgia, and eventually I pull away, needing space. Ryan glances toward me, silently offering to join me, but I shake my head. Once I've extricated myself from the press scrum, I make my way toward a familiar face beyond the edge of the crowd. It's Officer Matthews. It's weird to see her out of uniform, almost like an intrusion into her personal life. We've kept in touch since the barn incident. Mostly, our interactions have been official business, the fallout from what happened at the barn. But Officer Matthews has also taken on a few side projects, most notably looking into Delilah's case. Any news? I ask. She nods toward the street and we turn and walk together, away from the crowd. I know from her expression what the answer is, and my stomach twists with disappointment. Unfortunately, no, she says. We searched Brockman's house and a storage unit that belonged to him, as well as Richard Carlyle's house and office. There's no sign of anything that would connect them to Delilah. I let out a long sigh. I knew it was a long shot, but I've been so convinced that Brockman was responsible for Delilah's death. There has to be something out there that proves it. What about the investigation into the Order of St. Franklin? I ask. She purses her lips. You know I can't discuss an ongoing investigation. Off the record? I give her my best puppy dog pleading eyes. After all, I'd agreed to leave investigating the secret society to Officer Matthews in exchange for her looking into Delilah's case. She sighs. I can't go into details just yet, but we found some connections we're pretty sure the SEC will be interested in. Maybe Delilah figured that out too, and that's why they killed her. Officer Matthews is quiet a long moment. 
Then she stops and turns to face me. I know you think Brockman murdered your cousin. This is a conversation we've had before, and I start to bristle. She holds up a hand to stop me. And he might have. But you need to ask yourself why it matters so much to know that for sure. The answer seems so obvious to me that I'm almost insulted. Because I want to know the truth about what happened. I want the world to know that my cousin wasn't an addict. But she was an addict, Macy. Officer Matthews says gently, You've talked to her dealer. Tears spring into my eyes. I know she's not saying any of this to be cruel, but her words still sting. That's not all she was, I argue. But because everyone thinks she died of an overdose, that's all she's associated with anymore. Officer Matthews lays a hand on my shoulder. Then maybe that's where you should be putting your focus, she says. Not on how she died, but on who she was when she was alive. She gestures behind us at the bustling courthouse. You did that, Mackenzie. Not just by digging for the truth, but by making people care. You have a powerful voice as a storyteller. Use that to tell Delilah's story. You think justice means figuring out who might have killed her, but maybe, in this case, justice is in using Delilah's experience to tell a larger story about the drug crisis this city is living through. I swipe at the tears trailing down my cheeks, but say nothing. I'm not giving up on her case, she continues. I'm still going to keep digging, and I'm still going to be here to answer any questions you have. I just don't want you falling into the trap of thinking that finding answers, finding someone to blame, will solve all your problems. Sometimes it just isn't that easy. Officer Matthews squeezes my shoulder. Think about it, okay? I nod. Somewhere in my heart, I know she has a point, but I'm just not sure I'm ready to face it yet. I know I'll have to soon, just not today. She says her goodbye, and I take a moment to compose myself before turning back to the courthouse. I slip my phone from my purse and compose a short text to my parents. See you both at dinner on Wednesday? Taking a deep breath, I hit send. Already I feel lighter. I start back toward the courthouse. The crowd has begun to thin somewhat, and as soon as he sees me, Ryan comes jogging down the stairs to meet me. He seems completely unconcerned with the cameras that flash as he wraps his arms around me and presses his lips against mine. I return the kiss. So what now? I ask him when we finally come up for air. Don't you have a podcast to record? I figured you'd want to get the stuff from today up pretty fast. I shrug. The podcast can wait. He lifts his eyebrows, surprised. Really? I've decided I can't spend all my time talking about death. Sometimes, you have to actually live life. His lips twitch. I could finish giving you that tour of Hearthstone. We could pick up where we left off, he says, a gleam in his eye making clear exactly what his intentions are. Isn't Georgia living with you now? I ask. Won't she be there? His grin grows wider. She's gone out with her friends to celebrate the downfall of Dick and Richard Carlyle. So it will be just the two of us? A private tour, he says. For your eyes only. I push up onto my toes so I can kiss him again. That sounds perfect. And together, we stroll off down the sidewalk, leaving the courthouse and everything associated with it in our past as we look toward our future. Seven. I adjust my headphones and glance toward Ryan. He's sitting at a computer across the living room, monitoring sound. He gives me a thumbs up, which means everything's ready to go. All I have to do is talk. I take a deep breath and start in on my final dead air episode of the season. They say that on the night of Peg Graham's death, the horses in the Hearthstone barn screamed. They say it's because they somehow knew that their beloved mistress was lying up at the house dead and they were crying out in pain and loss. Which is a very eerie and moving tale, but it isn't the truth. Because now we know that the horses in Hearthstone's barn were screaming because they heard the gunshot that killed their mistress and they smelled her blood as she lay dying in their midst. This was before her body was moved, before the evidence was staged. 
before an innocent man pled guilty. Now, after more than a decade of cover-ups and lies, we know the truth. Peg Graham was killed in the Hearthstone barn, and it was her husband who did it. I let my opening breathe a little, and then lead into my official intro. Welcome to Dead Air, where M is now for midnight, Mackenzie, and murder. We've spent this first season of Dead Air looking into the murder of Peg Graham, and, in the end, we discovered the truth. I nod to Ryan, and he plays the audio we already have queued up. And as to the charge of manslaughter in the second degree, how do you plead? Guilty. I'm not going to lie. It felt good to stand in that courtroom and watch Dick Carlisle and his father finally take the fall for their role in Peg's death. And just in case there's any lingering confusion about what happened, here, in its entirety, is the courtroom recording of Dick Carlisle's allocution. I nod to Ryan again, and he splices in an excerpt from the hearing. I watch his expression as it plays, making sure it's not bringing too many unwelcome memories to the surface. He catches me looking his way and smiles. We do that a lot these days, checking in with each other, making sure the other's okay. We both know how toxic burying secrets can be. His dad's audio ends, and he points at me to continue. I lean toward the mic. So there you have it. The mystery of Pig Graham's murder solved. But that's not the end of the story, because there are still a lot of outstanding questions to work through. In this episode, I'm going to take a shot at answering the ones that have come up the most. For me, the biggest question that remains is about justice. Have we found justice for Peg by uncovering the truth of her death? In the beginning of this journey, my answer would have been yes. I would have told you that truth equals justice. Now, though, I'm not so sure because my notion of justice has been changing. I glance toward Ryan. He smiles, giving me a nod of encouragement. I smile back. Then I take a deep breath and continue. To explain why, let me tell you about my cousin Delilah. You're listening to Dead Air by Carrie Ryan, starring Lynn Norris, produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Realm, listen away. Dead Air is created by Gwenda Bond and written by Gwenda Bond, Rachel Kane, and Carrie Ryan. It is produced by Julian Yap and executive produced by Molly Barton. Audio production, sound design, editing, and theme music by Amanda Rose Smith.